the National League is basically upside down right now with all the surprise contenders. Which ones are for real? Let's talk about it. Locked on MLB. You are locked on MLB. Your daily MLB podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Hello, baseball fans. Welcome to Locked On MLB. Locked On Diamondbacks crossover. Every week, I, Paul Francis Sullivan, the host of Locked On MLB, your pal you can call Sully, does a crossover with this Bajaka Loop over there, who is the host of the Locked On Diamondback show. His name is... Miller Thomas, as you just said, host of the Locked On Diamondbacks podcast. You could catch us on all your streaming platforms, of course. You could also catch us on YouTube, Locked On Diamondbacks on there as well. Please hit subscribe. And if you want to follow us on social media, my personal Twitter account is at CreatorThomas24. You can see if you're looking for the YouTube audience or just type in Locked On Diamondbacks Twitter, Instagram for the podcast handle. Well, once a week we get together and we yap about baseball and yeah. uh, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun, and you can follow us at Locked On MLB Pods on Twitter or on Instagram. I am your pal Sully. I'm at Sully Baseball on Twitter, Sully Baseball Podcast on Instagram. Um, it, it is. I, I'm looking something up that I had calculated earlier. Um, we are living in an absolutely surreal time of the baseball season. Uh, I mentioned yesterday's show. The Yankees got swept by the Red Sox. The Dodgers got swept by the Giants. The Astros got swept by the Reds. Some of the top teams are just getting swept away by unlikely adversaries. And Mm -hmm. we're here. This is being dropped on the 20th day of June. Okay. We're officially in late June. So when you take a look at like your beloved Diamondbacks, we're sitting on top of the standings. You can no longer say it's early. When you see a surprise team, entering the back nine of June in contention, those teams could start to look around and go like, wait a minute, is this year for real? And with all of the insanity going on in the National League, Miller Thomas and I are going to be taking a look at some of the surprise contenders and see who's for real, who's not. And let me tell you something. Our dear friend Jeff Carr, the host of Locked on Reds, is waking up this morning with a wonderful sight, knowing that as of this recording, the Cincinnati Reds' magic number is 91 to clinch the National League Central. The Cardinals are in dead last place. The Reds are alone at the top of the standings. If you had told me at the beginning of the year that the Cardinals would have been in first place and the Reds would be at the bottom of the standings, I would have said, yeah, that sounds about right. But that's a little bit of what we're dealing with here. And, oh, by the way, the Giants did a leapfrog of the Dodgers, and they're all chasing the Diamondbacks right now. This is insane. Yeah, it's absolutely insane. Yeah, I can't believe what's going on in the National League right now because there's just so many teams. There's so many teams I really don't even believe in that are getting hot right now because we've talked about – we watched, you know, the beginning of the season with the uh, NL Central and some of these teams in the NOS who are really struggling. But now some of these teams are starting to turn it around and teams like the Cincinnati Reds that we're going to talk about are getting infusion of young talents are helping them. And teams like the Giants are getting hot and taking down the Dodgers who have been really incredible the entire season, but all of a sudden are starting to come back to the pack a little bit. So maybe we're seeing a double regression where some of the teams that were struggling those first couple months are starting to regress to the mean and starting to pick it up. Well, maybe there are some teams that got hot to start off the first couple months of the season. They're starting to cool off a little bit unlike the Arizona Diamondbacks who stay high well I the interesting thing is is that going into this year kind of like the previous year I uh, the two leagues had a distinct feel to it the American League felt like had a tremendous amount of parity because there wasn't a dominant team there was a lot of very good teams but the National League felt like there was top heavy you had super teams and you had garbage teams Well, this year, three of the teams that I thought were can't-miss contenders, the San Diego Padres, the New York Mets, and the St. Louis Cardinals, all have losing records 
here in late June. Mm -hmm. And because of that, that's allowed the doors to fling wide open. Now, your Arizona Diamondbacks are in first place as of this recording by about four, four and a half games. And, you know, they got off to a terrific start. And I kept thinking any minute now the Dodgers are just going to stampede, you know, that and you and I talked about at the beginning of the year, I thought the, the Diamondbacks were going to be a wild card contender. I did. I didn't think they were a bad team. I didn't think they would be in first place by themselves while the Dodgers were in third and the Padres were in fourth. And so we're at a point right now where the Diamondbacks have to be looked upon as a legit contender. This is no longer a, a like, well, they got off to a hot start. Like, we're rapidly approaching the midway point of the season. Yeah. And there's no sign that the Diamondbacks are going to have a great fall. Hopefully not. And honestly, it just feels like we're a lot of these teams. We just don't have a really great feel for what they are at this point in the season. Like, I want to feel great about the D-backs and everything. But we know past the Gallon and the Merrill Kelly and the rotation, it gets pretty thin. And you just go up and down like the standings, like – the AL East, I don't think it's surprising that Tampa Bay is leading it. I don't think it's surprising that the Twins lead the AL Central, but the Twins are a below 500 team. I think that's kind of shocking. The Rangers leading the AL West. The Braves is not shocking, but the Reds or the D-backs leading their divisions. Like You look at four of these top six divisions, and you're like, I'm kind of surprised with how that division is taken now. I'm kind of surprised with the results we've seen. And I think just overall this Major League season, you've talked about the parity like – even though we're nearing this halfway point, I still think we have so many questions about so many of these ball clubs. And I don't know if I've had this many questions. I feel like at least near the halfway point, of course, there's always teams that pick it up in the second half or, you know, fall off in the second half. But I felt like we at least had a group of teams that we felt really good about. Okay, they're going to be here in October. You know, the Houston Astros, we feel good about them. The Yankees feel good about them. But this year, I'm like, outside the Atlanta Braves and like Tampa Bay Rays, I wouldn't really say I'm locked into any team standing there, you know, in the final month of the season. Uh, Astro fans waking up today on June 20th will look at the standings and see their team is not a playoff team. Insane. That's crazy. Now, uh, we're going to jump into the who's for real, who's not starting segment two. But I want to stay on Arizona for a second. Because on yesterday's podcast, I talked about how I felt that the Yankees needed to acquire just a hitter. Okay. Any hitter they can get their hands on because their lineup desperately needs another professional hitter. I made the same case that the Los Angeles Dodgers need to make a deal just for a major league reliever, any major league arm who's be- who's average or better because they that just adding one to their um, bullpen would have gone gone such a long way to um, you know to basically say hey look at we've you know we've made a tiny improvement here one thing is a tiny bit better and that's what they desperately need to do with the diamondbacks as of this moment and i don't have a candidate right now but they just essentially need a single major league starting pitcher Mm -hmm. to just come in and say okay um you know we're we, we just need to make sure that our number three starter is someone who is adequate. Yeah. Someone and, like Jordan Montgomery, just someone like solid. I don't know. Yeah. Just someone off the top of my head, but someone decent. Like I had said, I had said in yesterday's show regarding the Yankees, a Randall Grichik. Okay. Not a great player by any stretch of the imagination, but uh, you know, a major league hitter and just adding a major league hitter to the staff you know, to their lineup would go a long way. Brad Hand, also of Colorado, insert him to the Los Angeles Dodgers bullpen, not saying he's going to be Raleigh Fingers, but at least it's a major league arm because the Dodgers bullpen this month has been grotesque and the Yankees lineup has been terrible. Same thing when you consider a game here or there could be the difference for Arizona, just an arm, a major league arm in there. You got to just bring that in. 
Yeah, and someone, a team that I've discussed because I think as we near the deadline, they've been kind of floundering. I think we've already seen discussions about how they might trade some of their rental players, but the Chicago White Sox, a team with Giolito, Lance Lynn, and if you want to get really crazy, Dylan Cease. They got a couple of relievers and the Kendall Gravemans and the Middletons. Like That's a team where I look at the D-backs. They have a ton of pitchers in the rotation, the bullpen. That's a team not going anywhere. Maybe you give up one of your young outfielders and go try to acquire another rotational depth piece to put behind a gallon Kelly from Chicago. You put Lance Lynn into this rotation, um, especially what we saw him do the other day where he struck out 16 batters and lost. Yeah. Um, uh, that would be a borderline ideal situation. Yeah, I just don't like his age, but if you got me Giolito or something who's like 27, fits perfectly, that's like perfect scenario, Giolito or Cease. I would take a Lance Lynn just as a veteran leader as my number three, number four. Well, I mean, at this point, you're not even talking like, yeah, his age is not really an issue at this point because you're talking about trying to win, you know, for this year. Yeah, But um, there are a bunch of potential contenders uh going on we're going to break that down oh before we go further into this uh we gotta so i gotta break down the uh the trivia question okay um where where did i just i just had that that up there so the question was at the end of the 1979 season the a's were on the verge of moving from oakland and in fact some publications were starting to say, yep, they're on their way. And it wasn't until the Raiders were making noise of moving to Los Angeles that a new ownership came in and saved the A's and kept them in Oakland for the 1980 season. A's fans are hoping a similar fate will happen with this team. What city did they nearly move to in 1979? Do you know the answer to this? I think we I, – I don't know. What is it? I don't know. Uh, and – a bunch of people got it correct. Some people got it wrong. Uh, I'm going to mention Gareth Davies oh. at uh, Jackal, uh, J-A-C-K, Jack Lemon, Jack Lemon Jelly. Okay, I don't know. Okay. Jack Lemon Jelly <laughs> is his uh, Twitter his handle. handle. He got it dead on. He said the A's nearly moved to Denver in 1979. They also flirted with New Orleans. So Ooh. if things had happened a certain way or if d uh, the Davises weren't making noise about uh, packing up to Los Angeles, you would have the Denver A's starting in 1980. And who knows what that would have done for a certain Ooh. player who was already in the A's system, actually played in 1979, named Ricky Henderson. What would his career Ooh. have been like if he was a star in Denver? But, hey, we're going to talk a little bit about – the uh you know which contenders are for real and which contenders are not for real but but who do we have to talk about today we're talking oh. about getting our tickets a's fans padres fans giants fans get your tickets and get them through game time buying tickets to your favorite event should not be a stressful experience game time is the fast and easy way to buy your tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater near you with killer deals on last-minute tickets and their best price guaranteed. You can stop stressing over tickets and start getting hype for all the fun that you will have. They got flash deals on last-minute tickets, easy to find and buy tickets for every event in your area. You get images of seat views, lowest price guarantee, event cancellation protection, job loss protection, etc., Forget about planning months in advance. You got the deals right to the day of the event. And the game time guarantee means you'll always get the best price. If you find tickets in the same section and row for less, game time will credit you 100% of the difference. Buy tickets in a matter of seconds. Two taps and you're set. Tickets are sent directly to your phone, so you never have to search for that email. So snag the tickets without the stress with game time. Download the game time app. Create an account and use the code LOCKEDONMLB for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code LOCKEDONMLB for $20 off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price, guaranteed. All right. Uh, Millard Thomas here. 
Me. Let's talk about some of the surprise contenders. We talked a lot about the Diamondbacks off the top, but mm-hmm. who are some of the other surprise contenders? By the way, I'll throw one out right now that I think is absolutely for real, and not just because I picked them to be a wild card team at the beginning of the year, mm-hmm. but the Miami Marlins are for real. Yeah, as they're building up wins and building up wins, and Luis Arise got his second five hit game of the week in today's victory. He is making a strong case to be the MVP of the National League as he is currently batting 400. And I know batting 400 and batting average isn't as sexy as it used to be, but batting 400 is batting 400. And he is putting together a phenomenal season, plus Jorge Soler, plus their good pitching. They're not even getting a great season from Sandy Alcantara. If he pitches well the second half, um, this Marlins team, I think, is playoff bound. Yeah, and they're super young. Their pitching is starting to come around. The Braxton Garrett to the world is still mm-hmm. – um, he's starting to heat up a little bit as well. Arias Ar- – how do you pronounce the name? Arias? Is that how you say it? Luis, Luis Arise. Luis Arise. He's having a great season. He should finish third on the MVP ballot behind Acuna and number one Corbin Barrels, of course, because that's how great of a season. We'll get into that a little bit later. But yeah, the the Miami Marlins, this has been a super young team. We always said if they can get better offensively, they're going to have a chance because of their pitching. Their offense, I mean, when you have a guy batting 400, it should at least be afloat enough to score enough runs, and they've been able to do that recently. Plus the NL East. I mean, of course, the Braves have been elite but teams like the Mets have really been struggling the Phillies are starting to come around now and honestly you look at the NL East and of course the Braves have been hot the Miami Marlins are heating up and then also you do have to worry about that Philadelphia Phillies team because that offense is starting to click I just saw it against the D-backs where they just won three out of four everyone up and down the Stotts the Harpers the Cassianos the Schwarbers like that offense starting to click they kind of have the same issues with the D-backs with rotational depth after the Wheeler and Nola's and Nola hasn't even been great or phenomenal this year but I don't want to count off or right off the Phillies just because they still have too much talent in that lineup. They still got some studs in that rotation. And they've with a guy like David Dombrowski, who's not afraid to get really aggressive, don't be surprised if they're another team with the payroll already inflated. I'm sure they're not afraid to add a few more dollars on that budget. All right. So uh throw some at me. Throw some at me. Uh who are some of the other surprise contenders going on this year? Yeah, I mean, honestly, the whole NL Central, I mean, we could talk about because I really don't know what to do with any of these teams. I mean, we discussed the Cincinnati Reds from this nine-game winning streak. The Brewers are a couple games above 500. The Pirates are starting to struggle now, but they've been in the mix. And then the Cubs are – they've won eight of their last ten games, and the Cubs potentially have the NL Cy Young – Front runner Marcus Stroman. They have another guy in Justin Steele who might finish top five in Cy Young voting too. So it's like the whole NL Central, I don't know what to do. It I makes don't know no sense. Reason. Makes no sense. The Reds are probably the least talented team on paper, but they're playing the best as a unit. So I just don't know what to do with that division at all. Well, I mean, this all stems from the fact that the Cardinals went into this year looking like they were the strong, you know, looking, we joked about it in our in our NL Central preview that they looked like the only team that was trying Going yeah. this year, and the pieces just don't fit. The pitching has been dreadful, and they've just been not getting the they've been not getting the the hits that they needed when they needed. And the Reds did something that, uh, frankly, uh, I made a call for all the teams in the NL Central to do, which was take your best prospects and bring them all up. What's Why the worst not? thing that could happen? You saw the uh, Pirates did that today with uh, um, Henry with Davis, Davis yeah. finally bringing, bringing him up. But, you know, De La Cruz and a bunch of the other players who they brought up have sparked this team. Now, granted, they, in this wild, you know, stretch of victories they've had, which catapulted them from, I think it was six games under 500 to now three games above 500 and being in first place by themselves – in just a, since June, they were six games under 500 10 days ago. Yeah. And now they're in first place. Yeah. Now you could point out the fact that they beat teams like St. Louis when they were down, Kansas City when they were down, but they also won the series against the Dodgers. They also swept the Houston Astros. Yeah. They've been being good teams. They've been beating good and bad teams. And they've, this all started 
when they decided to just bring up all their best pitch, all their best players, and have this be a lesson for teams, especially teams on the fringe, when they saw, hey, wait a minute, no one's taking this division. Yeah, and we okay. got a bunch of good players in the minor leagues. Worst case scenario is they're not ready. Best case scenario is they're ready. And De La Cruz is putting together a, with the way that he's sparked this club, he is putting together a terrific argument to be the National League Rookie of the Year. Runner up. Yeah. No, no, your boy is still, <laughs> your boy's still in the lead. Okay. Your boy's still in the lead. I'm not. I'm not taking that away from him. But what I'm saying is, when you look at the impact that De La Cruz, beyond just his numbers, yeah. but just how he's sparked the team uh, for these couple of weeks that he's been up, you know, look at he's been in in the league for 11 games, and in those 11 games, the Reds have gone from six games under 500 to in first place by themselves. That's not a coincidence. No, because like the rub against the D-backs, if you want to make the anti-D-backs argument, is their overall record against 500-plus teams is not exactly the best. They dominate against the worst teams in baseball against these below 500. But if you have a winning record against the D-backs, you have a good shot of at least being competitive in that series. The Cincinnati Reds just showed it doesn't matter what competition you put in front of them. They're going to take it to them. And I love your point of bringing up young players, specifically in that NL Central division, because it's like the perfect opportunity for anyone, right? You get to bring up these young players in an environment where you are competing for potentially a playoff spot. But at the same time, it's not high pressure because if you do make the playoffs, it's not like you have high expectations to go deep. So it's kind of perfect where it's like, Everything you do right now is going to help you build into the best version of yourself, put you in that winning kind of environment and get out the losing ways while also not having these championship expectations of like you have to win every game or your job is on the line. So I think it's really perfect situations for all those young players in the NL Central. And like you said, every team should be doing that. And also you just see how much a young player can impact your team, how much a rookie can impact your team from the De La Cruz's to the Corbin Carroll's of the world. Like these young players in Major League Baseball, if you're that good, they waste, they, they, these young stars coming up now, it wastes no time for them to make an immediate impact with the Juan Sotos and the Fernando Tatises and the Juan Francos of the world. Within the first year or two of these guys playing, you know immediately. And I wouldn't be surprised at the end of the season, we start having the De La Cruz contract extension to our conversations because the Cincinnati Reds are smart. They should probably lock up De La Cruz to a 10-year, what, $90, 150000000 million deal Do with Drew Corbin Carroll. Do it. All right. We're here with Miller Thomas of Locked On Diamondbacks. Fire off a couple more contenders. We'll see which ones are for real, which ones are going to fade away. Yeah, well, the other one for me, just look at the NL West. I mean, this San Francisco Giants team, all of a sudden, seven-game winning streak, actually has the best run differential in the NL West as well. I mean, this Giants team, I always thought they had, like, solid major leaguers. Like, we always talk about this Giants team as, like, a land of misfit toys where they have above-average major leaguers at a lot of positions. But we didn't feel like they had a lot of foundational building block pieces outside of a Logan Webb. Not a lot of franchise-changing players. We felt like they were just the perfect team where if you needed an extra utility piece or you needed that extra bat for the deep postseason run at the, at the deadline, then you go pick off a player from the San Francisco Giants. But right now, everyone just kind of coming together for them. Conforto's having like a pretty decent season. Jock Peterson, once again, is looking like the all-star of that team. J.D. Davis, like they've had so many dudes just put up crazy numbers. The Lamont Wades of the world is having a really fantastic season as well. And this Giants team, I just don't know what to expect them because they always feels like on paper I don't like them and then you look up at the standings at the end of the season they always do better than maybe our expectations for them they're kind of like the NL version of the Tampa Bay Rays I think well and Wade the other day off in against Los Angeles fouled the ball off his foot and the trainer to come out and we were like oh man and of course my thought always goes to the worst. I thought, oh my God, mm -hmm. he broke his foot. Is his career over? They got to amputate his leg. Is they got to, what's going to happen? And not only did he stay in the game, but he wound up homering and doubling and he got on base like four, three or four times and sparked the Giants to that victory. And there, there are always guys like that on this Giants team yeah. who are coming up to contribute. You saw today with, you know, Villar hit the huge home run. Yastrzemski hit the big, huge home run. 
they play better than the sum of their parts. And the Giants are a weird team, especially since Ga- Kapler arrived. Uh, I I was never impressed by Kapler as a manager with Philadelphia. I didn't. I, I never understood. Go back to the tape when Bochi decided to leave. I said, "Well, hand the car keys over to one of his lieutenants. Take a drink, everyone, and you know, hand the ball to you know, hand the managerial keys to Roberto Kelly, who was one of his coaches, or Ron Wotus, who was one of his coaches, or Hensley Mullins, who was one of his coaches, and instead they gave it to a guy who I never was impressed by as a manager." The COVID season happened. That was a wash. Then they won 107 games, and then they went 500. And so I've said on this show, I never thought they were as good as 107 wins, and I never thought they were as bad as 500. I felt they were somewhere in between. And we're seeing the Giants are basically playing like a team that's probably going to win 85, 86 wins, which is probably what they are, (laughs) which is probably what they actually are. And... um. And we're seeing them play, you know, playing well and, and getting some good pitching from some of their key pitchers. Um, and I, it wouldn't surprise me if they are contending by the end of the year. Yeah, and maybe they get frisky at the deadline, a team that was sniffing around the Aaron Judges and trying to sign the Carlos Correas last year. Maybe they say, you know what, we missed out on those star players, but we still have built this team that's on pace to win 90, you know, between 88 and 92 wins. Maybe we go out there and make a big splash at the deadline because as we always talk about, it seems like week in and week out, you just have to get in the postseason dance and then anything is possible. Maybe the Giants believe that. Maybe they go out there and add a piece or replace Brandon Crawford or something at the shortstop or maybe add another position or another pitcher in their rotation. They're dying to make a splash. Yeah. They're absolutely dying to make a splash. Um, but, you know, we'll see. Uh, the Pirates are very weird. They've had stretches where they look unbeatable and stretches where they look terrible. They happen to be in a terrible stretch right now. Um, and, uh, you know, anyone else in the – I mean, like the Phillies have come back. It's tough to call the defending National League champions a surprise. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it was surprising how – poorly they played and again we're keeping this to the positive surprises we've yapped enough about the Mets Cardinals and Padres um and you know the Brewers I think a bunch of people thought were going to be contenders um I I honestly think right now the most startling is the Reds who in uh, in fewer than two weeks have gone from complete also ran to you know to being in first place by themselves Right now, let me just, just to give everyone a sense of how strange this is, think about going into this year, how teams like the Mets, Cardinals, and San Diego were on the tips of everyone's tongues for being a, uh, for being playoff teams. If the playoffs started today, the two teams that would get the bye, you know, not have to play in the wildcard series would be the top-ranked Atlanta. And I think Atlanta was a consensus pick to be a playoff team. I know a lot of people thought the Mets might win the division. I thought the Braves were going to win the division. That's not at all surprising. So the top spot goes to Atlanta. The second spot, who gets the bye, would be Arizona. Oh! And then the – so then home field to the National League Central champion Reds, who would play the Dodgers – Wow. So the Dodgers would have to go to Cincinnati. And then the Giants would be one of the wild card teams, but they would be on the road against Miami. So Arizona, Cincinnati, and Miami would all be would all have home field. Well, actually, no, Arizona wouldn't be would even get to hit the buy. So Cincinnati and Miami would be the hosts of the wild card round. That's Meanwhile, insane. the uh Mets Padres, Cardinals, Phillies, Brewers, and Cubs would all be playing golf. That's weird. Yeah, That's weird. I I don't understand how this season is shaking up right now. And that Cincinnati Reds team, like, there's so many players. Like, Luke Weaver's, like, the number two starter for the Cincinnati Reds. And they're somehow winning games, which is just unbelievable i never thought there'd be a world where luke weaver's leading a rotation and he's been terrible don't get me wrong he's been terrible this year but somehow he's a number two starter for that cincinnati red team their whole rotation really hasn't been that good outside of hunter green who's been solid you know throwing 105 every time he can but that rotation just not good and somehow the cincinnati reds are winning ball games and welcome back joey Votto. 
Yeah. He came back and hit a home run today in his first game back. How Baseball's is always a little bit better with Joey Votto. So we're going to see how some of these surprise teams go. Um, I'm going to throw out our trivia question. So if you know the answer to the trivia question, be the first to post it either on to Sully Baseball on Twitter, uh, Locked on MLB Pods on Twitter, or here on the YouTube channel in our comments. Now, here is the question. Who was the last closer to lead the league in saves and throw the clinching pitch of the World Series in the same year? Oh, wow. That the man on the mound when they clinched the World Series and threw the final pitch was also the person who led the league in saves that year. If you know the answer, send it to me. Be the first to send me the correct answer at Sully Baseball on Twitter, Sully Baseball Podcast on Instagram or down here in the YouTube notes. Um, and I had, to, I had to double check this one. I had to double check this one because... I was like, oh, wait a minute. Did I get this wrong? Did I get that? And then I had, oh, whoa. There was a couple of times someone led the league in saves. Um, and you're like, oh, wow. Uh, I don't remember that one. Do not remember that one. But is it one of those? Is it a very obscure name? That, no. Is, okay. No, it's a well known name. That's one okay, hint. Well it was a well, it wasn't like Mike Montgomery closing out the World Series for the Cubs. Also, it just shows that sometimes the player who piles up the most saves is not necessarily the one who's closing out the World Series, but also a bunch of times the person on the mound when they clinch is not someone you're expecting when the year began. You have a situation like Koji Uehara. By the way, the answer is not Koji Uehara because he wasn't even the Red Sox closer for the first third of that season. But you've also seen some strange ones like Madison Bumgarner came out of the bullpen for the Giants or Chris Sale came out of the bullpen for the Red Sox or Charlie Morton came out of the bullpen for the uh, uh, Houston Astros and Mike Montgomery pulled the, was the, uh, the last man standing for the Cubs. So tell me the last pitcher to clinch the world series who also had led his league in saves that year, send that along and we will talk. Um, hey, uh, Miller Thomas, tell people again where they can listen to your show. <clears throat> yeah, we're on all your streaming platforms. Of course, we're also on YouTube, Lock on Diamondbacks on there. So please hit subscribe. And if you want to follow me on social media at Career Thomas24 for my personal account on Twitter or look up Locked on Diamondbacks on Twitter, Instagram for the podcast handle. All right. And you can find us at Locked on MLB Pods on Twitter and Instagram. I'm your pal Sully. I'm at Sully Baseball on Twitter, Sully Baseball Podcast on Instagram. Hey. Talking hey. about those surprise National League teams. They've been turned upside down, which could mean for a really fun, frantic second half of the season when it comes around. This is a locked on MLB, locked on Diamondbacks crossover. I'm your pal Sully. He's Miller Thomas. Let's fist pump for another week. <laughs>